Welcome back. We are continuing our quest to develop Second Commandment Theology, which is a study of loving your neighbor as yourself to fulfill the believer's commission to make disciples, which means reaching the lost again for salvation and teaching the saved to serve for sanctification. In the last lesson, I examined the spiritual aspects of addiction as besetting sin. In this lesson, we will examine ancestral sin, also known as generational curses. Now, ancestral sin or generational curses is a notion that individuals inherit the sinful proclivities of their ancestors. It exists primarily as a concept as referenced in the Bible in Exodus 25, which says, You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Now, ancestral sin or generational curses is a repeating pattern of misfortune that is present in multiple generations of a family, such as illness, certain negative behaviors, or recurring outside events. Some connect ancestral sin, again, or generational curses. I'm going to just say general, generational curses from here on, to the doctrine of original sin. Now, those are linked. The Christian doc now that is a Christian doctrine. original sin. Let me get this straight: is the Christian doctrine that holds that humans, as descendants of Adam and Eve, inherit a corrupted, sinful nature with a proclivity to sinful conduct, and all of us are in need of regeneration. The biblical basis for the belief is found in Genesis three where the fall of humankind and the expulsion of Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden is revealed. Support for the doctrine of original sin is also contained in Psalm 51 verse 5. It says, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. And in Romans 5 12, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people because all sin. The secular world now calls the entire Genesis narrative and supporting scripture myth. I just want to make sure I fit that in there. Oh, that's a myth. And I've covered that in an earlier lesson about myth and, and the gospel. Therefore, spiritual punishment then from the world's perspective for sins like idolatry, adultery, and other trespasses are considered mythical fantasies. Now, others see ancestral sin or generational curses as trauma that persists from parents to children or a series of consequences for an action rather than a literal curse. Types of generational curses include disobedience, violence, idolatry, bad habits, and illness. I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. There are two primary sources for generational curses. Those are, there, there are those that are passed down from a previous generation and new curses inflicted during the current generation. However, there is a loose connection between ancestral sin, generational curses, inherited guilt, shame, punishment, adversity, or genetic corruption. Now, I'm going to say a word about each one of those as we go. You've probably heard someone say, when bad or unwanted circumstances just keep repeating, and other people outside say, well, it just runs in the family. That's just how they are. It seems then that individuals and even families all seem to carry the excess baggage of bad luck, bad health, divorce, bad relationships, victimhood, addictions, destructive behaviors, 
emotions, and other harmful ways, means, and actions. We, every family has the same situation. All right. So, since every person is a born sinner, every person has some toxic behavior that needs healing. We all have an issue. We all have our issues. We're all a piece of work. Come on. Again, a generational curse then, I'm, I'm repeating myself, is toxic habits or behaviors passed from one generation to the next. He's just like his daddy or he's just like his mom or she's just like her mama. One of those kinds of things. However, one is not automatically cursed through his or her bloodline. I want to make sure this is, I'm clear on this. If one has a family history of drug or alcohol addiction, it doesn't automatically mean that that person will have the same problem. However, the passing down depends on the individual, how he or she is impacted, groomed, or socialized in circumstances of nature versus nurture. Get that, nature versus nurture. Those are, but, but let's keep going. <clears throat> the origin of the concept of ancestral sin or generational curses comes from Proclius, assertion that a city or a family is to be seen as a single living being more sacred than any, any individual human life. <clears throat> now, Celsus, a Greek scholar, is quoted as saying, the mills of the gods grind slowly, even to the children's children and to those who are born after them. The idea of divine justice taking the form of collective punishment is also pervasive in the Hebrew Bible, meaning that we're talking about the 10 plagues of Egypt, for example, the destruction of Shechem, uh, examples like that. But most notably, the recurring punishments inflicted on the Israelites for lapses by their leadership. I'm talking about the sins of the kings. You had a good king or a bad king, a bad king, would have the Israelites would suffer, or religious leaders and family leaders. It's all throughout the Old Testament. <clears throat> Most Christians link ancestral sin or generational curses, again, to Exodus 20, verse 5, now, which is directly connected to idolatry. Verses 2 and 3 talk about idolatry, and just roll right on into verse 5. The implication is that anything put in the place of God potentially becomes a catalyst that can impact others in one's family or community circle and the entire nation for that matter. Which now now and all of that is a catalyst for unresolved issues that get handed down from generation to generation. However, Jesus, I'm going to get we got to get him in here is the bondage breaker, and Jesus is able to break the cycle of any curse, but only if the sinner accepts and believes the gospel. That's critical. The Christian doctrine of original sin, now I'm going back to that, is an extension of the concept of an ancestral sin, or generational curses, if you want to put it that way, that argues that the sin of Adam and Eve is inflicted on all their descendants, which is all humanity, and is inflicted on us indefinitely. The concept of original sin then, but now here's the interesting part. The concept of, of, of original sin wasn't developed by Judaism or developed in Judaism. It was developed in the second century by Arrhenius, a bishop of Lyons who asserted that the fall was a step in the wrong direction by Adam with whom his descendants had some solidarity or identity. He linked it back. Now, this is a Christian doctrine, not a, not a Jewish or an Islamic doctrine, even though we're all considered people of the book. 
other Christian views, uh, let me say it this way, other Christians now, we have several versions of this. I said it in earlier, that's, that first 400 years, there was, there was a whole lot out there before we got around to an orthodox view of Christianity and its doctrines. But now other Christians view ancestral sin or generational curses, I'm putting them both back in, as an inclination towards sin, a heritage from the sin of our progenitors. But the inclination to sin is distinguished from original sin as a tendency that remains after salvation. I mean, we've sinned since we've been saved. That's what that's the idea here. Be, but, but now what they're saying is because the penalty of ancestral sin is removed through a believer's baptism into the body of Christ. Now, let me go further with that. Now, to explain the view, it is that because of ancestral sin, which we have been calling original sin, I got to keep trying to keep all these terms together. The human image was tarnished and disfigured because of Adam and Eve's disobedience. The concept that the sin of the first couple, together with all its consequences and penalties, were transferred by means of natural heredity to the entire human race. Since every human being is a descendant of the first couple, no one is free from the stain of sin. However, at salvation, regardless of one's ancestral or generational circumstances and consequences, the penalty of sin had, is rescinded. That's the, that's, that's the value of accepting Christ as Savior. Now, the Catholic view of ancestral sin, where the Latin text has original sin, exists only in an analogical sense. It is a sin contracted, not committed. Come on here, follow my string. It is a state, not a status. One is born a sinner before any act of sin is committed. Baby just being born is a sinner. That, that's a sinner, even though they haven't done anything yet. Paradoxically, one does not become a sinner because he or she sins. Did you, I said the baby born is a sinner. Did you catch that? The, night, the baby hadn't done anything yet. This is very important. One sins. The reason why we sin is because we are sinners. That's why we sin. It's not because we don't become sinners. We are sinners and we sin. Eastern Orthodox doctrine asserts it can be said that while we have, now here's another view, while we have not inherited the guilt of Adam's personal sin, the entire human race is possessed of an essential ontological unity. I mean, we're, we're, we're in this. Every person participates in the human nature by virtue of one's inclusion in humanity. Come on here. The imparting of original sin by means of natural heredity should be understood in terms of the unity of the entire human nature connected by nature to constitute one mystic whole. Inasmuch as human nature is indeed unique and unbreakable, the imparting of sin from the firstborn to the entire human race descended from him is rendered rational. Come on here. The a Adam and Eve, being the root who suffered corruption, passed that corruption to all their descendants. Now, skeptics classify the notion of curses as mythology. We've all, I've already brought that out. And that includes family curses. In addition, because of the glorification of personal individuality, and to individual achievement, there are, there is resistant attitudes to the notion of inherited sin. Ironically, the rejection of original sin leads to the rejection of the gospel, because why does one need the gospel 
if he or she is not a sinner. That's logical. Psychologists and philosophers tend to portray persistent human failings as part of human imperfection rather than using original sin metaphors. Now, the types of ancestral or generational curses include one, disobedience. This is a curse thought to be inflicted by God himself because of the fall of, of, of humankind in Genesis. Genesis 3.17 states, Curse is the ground because of you. Now, some believe that Adam and Eve's first disobedience in eating the forbidden fruit caused all children to rebel against their parents. That is the, that is the foundation of the rebellion in children against their parents. As the first humans, they were rebelled against God. This is said to be the first curse and all other curses come from it. As a result, many families are thrown into disarray because of conflicting beliefs or convictions rather than living in harmony. So signs of this is unruly children, emotionally distant parents or children, family ruptures, negative feelings toward family members, constant disagreements. Then there's two, violence. Violence is a curse is a curse of, that humans inflict on other humans. The word Hamas, we hear that in the news, but it is a biblical word, appears again in the Hebrew Bible in the context of violence, but also in the context of sin. Injustice, judicial matters, structural violence, and the problem of evil. Hamas also refers to verbal, moral, and or, and or ethical violence. Sometimes the word refers to extreme wickedness. Isaiah 59 verse 6 says, Their cobwebs are useless for clothing. They cannot cover themselves with what they make. Their deeds are evil deeds, and, their, and acts of violence are in their hands. Violence, then, is defined around four main areas that which damages the environment, dishonors or oppressive speech, and issues of justice and purity. And war is a special category of violence addressed in four different ways, including pacifism, non-resistance, just war, and a crusade. The term Hamas can be a cry to God in the face of injustice and characterize a false or violent witness. The notion is that a false witness threatens life as a form of violence. This type of violence is a catalyst for physical or emotional abuse, manipulation, unkind words, now called bullying, negative thoughts, and, and the like. But its effect or impact are lasting and can span generations. It is one of the most common curses and affects more than just the family unit, but the entire, but all of society. Things like we call people out of their names. We have names for Asians. We have names for black people. We have names for white people. And those, the, those names continue to exist. So signs are, of this are physical or emotional aggression, chronic frustration, resentment toward family members, frequent insults or arguments. Idolatry is number three. Exodus 20, 2 through 3, I mentioned earlier, says, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. The curse, now, the curse of idolatry is when a person idolizes something other than God, which leads to spiritual neglect, as well as the neglect of their children or other family. This idol might be wealth, fame, lust, or anything else that takes their attention away from their duty as a parent or as a spouse or as just a family member, and as most, most importantly, as a believer. Signs are lack of prayer, loss of faith, neglecting familial relationships, spending large amounts of money on luxuries, being easily and being easily distracted when praying. Then there are bad habits. This is also known, I mean, this is four, 
as the curse of the ill harvest. Galatians 6, 7 says, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Now, in the context of a generational curse, this might refer to the habits one uses to build the coveted worldly good life. Sowing bad habits like adultery, sloth, or envy only causes one to reap a destructive harvest and tainted morals. Those morals then rub off on one's children, and they in turn teach their own children those bad habits. Hosea 4, 6 says, My people are destroyed from a lack of from a lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also reject you as my priest. Because you have ignored the law of your God, I also will ignore your children. Now, signs of destructive tendencies, like the signs are destructive tendencies like laziness or gluttony, warped morals, tendencies to sin rather than turn toward God, difficulty changing behavior, reluctance to seek forgiveness. Then there's five, illness. Many illnesses are genetic and therefore passed down from parent to child. In this way, congenital illnesses are a kind of generational curse. It is, now, now think about this, it is nobody's fault But the result of original sin, when death came into being, sin introduced a virus into the genetic mapping of humanity that results in that results in physical death. We die because of sin. We've covered this earlier, but I just want to reiterate it. Sickness may now think about this. Sickness may be physical, like cancer, diabetes, heart disease or illness may be mental, like depression addiction, anxiety, mood, substance abuse, or personality disorders, all of which might be passed genetically. Now, signs of this are chronic or hereditary illnesses, addictions, mental illness, like depression, and other disorders, fatigue, like a passion for God, or family. Now, the question is, are generational curses real? Ezekiel 18.20 says, The child will not share in the guilt of the parent, nor will the parent share in the guilt of the child. Now, this suggests that latter generations will not be blamed for the sins of earlier generations, which may now which may cause this or may cause you uh, get us to refigure or reconfigure. I'll say it that way, how we approach the concept of generational curses. That said, just because children aren't to be blamed for their parents' sin, it doesn't mean that they aren't impacted by or suffer in or because or for because of those sins. Generational curses do have a natural evidence. What Christians view now, I'm I'm, I'm saying there is a a secular side to this. What Christians view as generational curses, psychologists might call generational trauma. Generational trauma is the idea that a certain trauma or misfortune that happens to a parent can persist into the life of a child, causing further trauma or misfortune. These misfortunes are varied and diverse from illness to societal injustice, physical abuse. For example, think about this. How does prejudice and bias get passed along? Well, the lyrics of a 1949 Rodgers and Hammerstein song called Carefully Taught, Carefully Taught from the movie South Pacific is revealing. Here's how it goes. You've got to be carefully taught to hate and fear. You've got to be taught from year to year. It's got to be drummed into your dear little ear. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be taught to be afraid of people whose eyes are oddly made and people whose skin is a different shade. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be taught before it's too late, before you are six or seven or eight, to hate all the people your relatives hate 
You've got to be carefully taught. There it is. Now, breaking generational curses. Now, how we do that? Ezekiel 18 asserts that ancestral or generational curses are within the moral responsibility of the person. Some view the notion of inherited corruption or inherited culpability or inherent culpability, corporate responsibility, and accumulated guilt as unjust. Ezekiel 18 appears to depart from that context and focus on the moral responsibility of the individual. Now, this understanding is compatible with modern individualism, which stresses individual moral accountability, but misses the primary communal focus of the passage. The primary focus of this chapter, I'm talking about Ezekiel 18, is not so much on the legal individual culpability as on the divine justice resting afresh on each generation in accord with what that generation deserves. Every descendant of Adam and Eve was conceived in sin, shaped in iniquity, and born a sinner. Adam and Eve were created innocent in a sinless environment and willfully chose to disobey. Every descendant of Adam and Eve is born guilty with a sinful nature in a sinful environment and must willfully choose to obey. Ezekiel provides a case study exemplified in three generations uh, where you have a righteous father, his wicked son, who in turn fathers a righteous son. Each case follows the same pattern. The behavior and moral character is introduced, illustrated by a list of actions and concluded by a statement regarding either life or death as appropriate. Ezekiel anticipates now an unasked question. Why should not the son suffer for the iniquity of the unrighteous father? Well, for the same reason that the son cannot share in the benefit of one's righteous father. As Jesus later delineated in John 3.18, I'm not going to quote it, it's, you know, but now go back and read it. A wicked person, but the gist of it is a wicked person who repents and lives rightly before God versus one who does not. However, now here's what I got to get in here. This is what's most important. Sandwiched between the opposing decisions is a central declaration of God's pleasure in one's repentance and the denial of that same pleasure in one's rejection. God doesn't want you to go to the lake of fire. Come on here. He wants you to repent. Therefore, regardless of one's circumstances, in this life, one's future salvation or condemnation is self-serving. God accommodates the free will decision of the individual. Come on here. We are stopping here. In this lesson, my goal was to use the theological encyclopedia to address ancestral sin or generational curses to illustrate that regardless of one's life's lottery, the only thing that matters is believing God's truth. So, may God bless and keep you. Amen, amen, and amen.